Chapter 14 of Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosie. Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous by Sarah Knowles Bolton. Chapter 14. Joseph Marie Jacquard. The small world which lives in elegant houses knows little of the great world in dingy apartments with bare walls and empty cupboards. Those who walk or ride in the sunshine often forget the darkness of the mines or the tiresome treadmill of the factories. Over a century ago, in Lyon, France, lived a man who desired to make the lives of the toilers brighter and happier. Joseph Jacquard, the son of a silk weaver who died early, began his young manhood the owner of two looms and a comfortable little home. He had married Claudine Boisson, the daughter of a goldsmith who expected to give his daughter a marriage portion, but was unable from loss of property. Jacquard loved her just as devotedly, however, as though she had brought him money. A pretty boy was born into their home, and no family was happier in all France. But the young loom owner saw the poor weavers working from four in the morning till nine at night in crowded rooms, whole families often bending over a loom, their chests shrunken and their cheeks sallow from want of air and sunlight, and their faces dull and vacant from the monotony of unvaried toil. There were no holidays, no walks in the fields among the flowers, no reading of books, nothing but the constant routine which wore out body and mind together. There was no home life, little children grew pinched and old, and mothers went too early to their graves. If work stopped, they ate the bread of charity and went to the almshouse. The rich people of Lyon were not hard-hearted, but they did not think. They were too busy with their parties and their marriages, too busy buying and selling that they might grow richer. But Jacquard was always thinking how he could lighten the labor of the silk weavers by some invention. The manufacture of silk had become a most important industry. Seventeen hundred years before Christ, the Chinese had discovered the making of silk from silkworms and had cultivated mulberry trees. They forbade anybody to export the eggs or to disclose the process of making the fabric under penalty of death. The Roman Emperor Justinian determined to wrest this secret from China and thus revive the resources of his empire. He sent two monks who ostensibly preached Christianity, but in reality studied silkworms, and secreting some eggs in two hollow reeds, returned to Justinian, and breaking these canes, laid the eggs on the lap of the beautiful Empress Theodora. From this the art spread into Italy, and thence into France. The more Jacquard thought how he could help the silk weavers of France, the more he became absorbed, and forgot that money was needed to support his family. Soon the looms had to be sold at auction with his small home. The world ridiculed and his relatives blamed him, but Claudine, his wife, encouraged him and prophesied great fame for him in the future. She sold her little treasures and even her bed to pay his debts. Finally, when there was no food in the house, with tears in his eyes, Jacquard left his wife and child to become a laborer for a lime burner in a neighboring town. Claudine went to work in a straw bonnet factory, and for sixteen years they battled with poverty. Then the French Revolution burst upon Lyon in 1793. Her crime before such murderers as Robespierre and Marat was that she was the friend of Louis XVI. Sixty thousand men were sent against her by the so-called Republicans, who were commanded to utterly destroy her and write over the ruins, Lyon made war upon liberty, Lyon is no more. Six thousand persons were put to death, their houses burned, and twelve thousand exiled, among them Jacquard. His only child, a brave boy of sixteen, had joined the Republican ranks, that he might fight against the foreign armies of England, Austria, and Naples, who had determined, under Pitt, to crush out the new government. At the boy's earnest request, his father enlisted with him, and together they marched toward the Rhine. In one of the first battles, a cannonball struck the idolized son, who fell expiring in Jacquard's arms. Covered with the blood of his only child, he dug a grave for him on the battlefield, and exhausted and heartbroken, went to the hospital till his discharge was obtained. He returned to Lyon and sought his poor right. He returned to Lyon and sought his poor wife. At last he found her in the outskirts of the city, living in a hayloft and earning the barest pittance by spreading out linen for the laundresses to dry. She divided her crusts with her husband while they wept together over their irreparable loss. She soon died of grief, but, with her last words, bade Jacquard go forward in developing his genius and have trust in God, who would yet show him the way of success, 
Blessed Claudine, a sweet, beautiful soul, shining like a star in the darkness of the French Revolution. Jacquard, with all earthly ties severed, went back to the seclusion of inventing. After his day's work was done as a laborer, he studied on his machine for silk weaving. Finally, after seven years, a long time to patiently develop an idea, he had produced a loom which would decrease the number of workmen at each machine by one person. The model was placed at the Paris Industrial Exposition in 1801, and the maker was awarded a bronze medal. In gratitude for this discovery, he went to the image of the Virgin which stood on a high hill, and for nine days ascended daily the steps of the sacred place. Then he returned to his work, and seating himself before a Vaucanson loom, which contained the germ of his own, he consecrated himself anew to the perfecting of his invention. Jacques de Vaucanson, who died when Jacquard was thirty years old, was one of the most celebrated mechanicians of France. His automatons were the wonder of the age. He exhibited a duck, which, when moved, ate and drank like a live one. The figure would stretch out its neck for food, and swallow it, walk, swim, dabble in the water, and quack most naturally. His musician, playing the flagellet with the left hand and beating the tambourine with the right, executing many pieces of difficult music with great accuracy, was an astonishment to every body. He had been appointed inspector of silk factories at Lyon, and because he made some improvements in machines, he was pelted with stones by the workmen, who feared that they would thereby lose their labor. He revenged himself by making a machine which wove, brocaded, and colored at the same time, and was worked by a donkey. It remained for Jacquard to make the Vaucanson loom of the utmost practical use to Lyon and to the world. After a time, he was not only able to dispense with one workman at each loom, but he made machinery do the work of three men and two women at each frame. The city authorities sent a model of this machine to Paris, that the Emperor Napoleon might examine it. So pleased was he that he at once sent for Jacquard to come to Paris. The latter had previously invented a machine for making fishing nets, now used in producing Nottingham lace. When brought before Bonaparte, and Carnot the Minister of the Interior, the latter asked, Is it you, then, who pretend to do a thing which is impossible for man, to make a knot upon a tight thread? Jacquard answered the brusque inquiry by setting up a machine and letting the incredulous minister see for himself. The Emperor made Jacquard welcome to the Conservatoire des Arts des Métiers, where he could study books and machines to his heart's content, and gave him a pension of about twelve hundred dollars for his discovery. When he had, with his own hands, woven a magnificent brocaded silk dress for the Empress Josephine, he returned to Lyon to set up the Jacquard looms. His name began to be lauded everywhere. Claudine's prophecies had at last come true. She had given her life to help him, but she could not live to share his honors. Soon, however, the tide of praise turned. Whole families found themselves forced into the street for lack of work, as the looms were doing what their hands had done. Bands of unemployed men were shouting, Behold the traitor! Let him provide for our wives and children, now driven as mendicants from door to door, or let him, the destroyer of the people's labor, share in the death which he has prepared for us. The authorities seemed unable to quell the storm, and by their orders the new loom was broken in pieces in the public square. The iron, says Jacquard, was sold as old iron, the wood for fuel. One day he was seized by a crowd of starving workmen who knocked him down and dragged him to the banks of the Rhone, where he would have drowned at once had not the police rescued him, bleeding and nearly dead. He left the city overwhelmed with astonishment and sorrow. Soon Switzerland, Germany, Italy, and America were using the Jacquard looms, largely increasing the manufacture and sale of silk, and therefore the number of laborers. The poor men of Lyon awoke to the sad fact that, by breaking up Jacquard's machines, they had put the work of the silk weaving into other hands all over the world, and idleness was proving their ruin. They might have doubled and tripled the number of their factories, and benefited labor a thousandfold. The inventor refused to take out a patent for himself, nor would he accept any offers made him by foreigners, because he thought all his services belonged to France. He loved the working people, who, for twenty years, were too blind to see it. He removed to a little home and garden at Wilin, near Lyon, the use of which had been given him for life, where he could hear the sound of his precious looms on which he had worked for sixty years, and which his city had at last adopted. Here he attended his garden and went every morning to early church, distributing each day some small pieces of money to poor children. 
As old age came on, Leon realized the gratitude due her great inventor. A silver medal was awarded him, and then the grand distinction of the Cross of the Legion of Honor. People from the neighboring towns visited Willine and pointed out with pride the noble old man at 84, sitting by his garden wall, dressed like a workman in his long black tunic, but wearing his broad red ribbon with his cross of honor. Illustrious travelers and statesmen visited him, whose fame was now spread through Europe and America. Toinette, a faithful servant who had known and loved Claudine, watched over the pure-hearted Jacquard till death came, August 7, 1834. Six years after, Lyon, which once broke which once broke his machine and nearly killed him, raised a beautiful statue of him in the public square. The more than 70,000 looms in the city, employing 200,000 workmen, are grander monuments even than the statue. The silk weavers are better housed and fed than formerly. The struggling, self-sacrificing man, who might have been immensely rich as well as famous, was an untold blessing to labor and to the world. End of chapter 14. Recording by Rosie.